Hello, I'm Bob Denton and welcome to another conversation. My guest for a conversation is Virginia's 48th Attorney General, Jason Mayares. Attorney Mayares served in the House of Delegates from 2015 until his election in 2021. And thanks so much for joining me. Bob, it's great to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, you know, you're not a stranger to uh, these parts, if I'm not mistaken. You went to Salem High School? Well, I went to Salem High School in Virginia Beach. In Virginia Not Beach. Not Salem High School here. I know there is another Salem. I spent my early childhood <laughs> in, in uh, East Tennessee and then moved to Virginia Beach when I was a child and have called Virginia home ever since. But I like to say I have mountain air in my lungs and salt water in my veins. <laughs> I love coming out here. I'm uh, married to a Virginia Tech grad, so I'm a Hokey by marriage. Wonderful. And of course, could say that you went to James Madison University. I did, went right up the valley uh, to James Madison University, got a business degree. And then for some reason, I thought the world was in desperate need of another lawyer. <laughs> and so I went off to William and Mary. <laughs> well, before we get into some of the real initiatives and, and issues of, of concern, I'd just like to take a reflective moment about the historic nature of last year's election. What do you think was the message that determined and led to victory, especially considering going up against a two-term incumbent? Yeah, it was a little daunting. I, I remember on election night, uh, uh, one of the guys on my team, my political team, said, you know, if we win, you'd be the first candidate to defeat an incumbent attorney general in Virginia since 1885. And I said, well, I am so glad I did not know that when I was thinking <laughs> about whether to run. Uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why. Um, uh, I was very concerned about the direction of Virginia, particularly on public safety. I was a prosecutor in Virginia Beach before I had gotten elected to the Virginia House of Delegates. Um, I think there was maybe some well-intentioned legislation, but the results were not good for Virginia. Our murder rate had been the highest it was in two decades. And there was just a general sense of maybe Richmond was uh, just kind of really, really, I thought, shifted way far too far to the left and so we decided to jump in it was a hard decision uh, it was not an easy one uh, we ran really really hard for a little over 12 months and we're really grateful that the people of virginia hired hired me to serve them in this capacity as their attorney general and i think the previous attorney general was certainly from my standpoint over the years here one of the most political quite frankly in terms of some of the things that he uh, supported and and, and did <laughs> You know, it's been a really tough two and a half years for law enforcement in general. When we think about the 2020 with the, the riots, uh, police officers becoming victims themselves of violence, target of, of, of violence. Um, now a lot of job vacancies. From a 30,000 foot view, it just seems like that it's been a real tough time for law enforcement in general. It has. I mean, that's the one thing I saw out on the campaign trail and leading up to my decision to run was this, uh, this collapse of morale in law enforcement. They felt that they had been <clears throat> demonized and attacked. I remember meeting with an officer from Enrico who said, you know, I, I got into law enforcement because I was bullied in high school and now I'm on this job and I'm being told I'm the bully. And it really affected them. They felt uh, there was a lot of laws that made their job difficult. Um, you obviously heard a lot of this to fund the police chatter for a period of time. And they, they felt like suddenly they were the bad guy. And, and I have said, you know, they have the hardest job uh, in America. You know, I go to work in the morning, I put on a coat and tie, I grab my coffee mug. Uh, they, go to co they go to work in the morning, they have to put on a bulletproof vest. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a job unlike anything else. And, uh, you know, I first grew a deep appreciation for them when I was a prosecutor and then obviously serving the General Assembly and now as Attorney General. Uh, they really are some of the very, very best of Virginia and uh, they, they have suffered through a lot of morale that's caused a lot of early retirements. You know, the governor put in his budget a very, very large pay increase for our law enforcement. We're trying to give them the tools and make them feel appreciated. Uh, I just spoke at the Sheriff's, Virginia Sheriff's Association yes, uh, you know, earlier, and they're just grateful that they feel like somebody in Richmond has their back, and that's kind of what we want to communicate to them. You know, in a Gallup poll in just this uh, current past July, only 45% of Americans by the Gallup poll have a great deal or a lot of confidence in law enforcement, and that's down from 51% just a year ago. It seems like there's this coarseness of culture, this lack of respect, and. It's all time lows, and of course, all institutions are polling mm. lower now. 
But I find that a little bit frightening and what it says in terms of making the job even tougher. Yeah, I don't, I, I think in general, I don't think it's healthy for our republic. I don't think it's healthy for our democracy to have this wholesale questioning of so many of our institutions that we used to revere. And whether that's on kind of the populist left or the populist right, you see that, whether it's the media or law enforcement or uh, free markets, uh, you have this really kind of fraying and you are what you eat, but you're also the news you consume. <laughs> and sure. for some Americans, they get siloed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I would say this, uh, the vast, vast majority of Americans do not live their lives uh, the way sometimes some on the national cable news portray it. Uh, we all have friends of ours that think differently than we do, that vote differently than we do. Uh, and that's the beauty of America is that you can disagree but not be disagreeable. Uh, I think it's healthy part of democracy to try to bring a sense of decency back into the public arena. Um, you know, it's, it is a little bit of a coarse time. Uh, as our culture has gotten more coarse, I think so is our politics. And so that's one thing I try to emphasize to my staff and to my team. Uh, civility is not weakness. I think that's a really important thing for people that are public servants to have that mindset. That's a mindset that I try to bring in the role as attorney general. Well, let's talk a little bit and, uh, and mention crime. Um, we know that crime rates are up across virtually all areas across the nation. It's true in Virginia, but Virginia is not as bad as other localities. In fact, Virginia crime rate is actually uh, the lowest of all the states in the South Atlantic region. But Virginia did see 562 homicides reported for the last year, and that's up 6%. Problems are primarily in the inner city, but how do we go about in terms of the aspects of homicides, such an increase? Well, I mean, listen, as somebody who's personally, you know, when I was a prosecutor, prosecuted uh, criminal and felony cases, uh, I know that the biggest way to drop a violent crime is actually get repeat violent offenders off our streets. Uh, there are proven methods that have been used and have been shown to be effective, which is uh, if you're uh, a violent felon using a gun in a commission of a crime, you go after that violent felon, you prosecute him to the full extent of the law, and you get them off the street. Uh, that is the most effective way to lower violence. And so that's something that I've been an advocate for. That's something my office is in the process of hiring new prosecutors. We cross-designate them with the U.S. Attorney's Office so they can go after repeat violent offenders that are using these guns on our streets. You have a huge problem in, in Roanoke, uh, in a lot of these metropolitan areas, uh, in, in Portsmouth and in Richmond as well. So you really want to zero in and go after these repeat violent offenders and get them off our streets. That's kind of our goal and something I've been an advocate for, and I know the governor believes in it as well. Well, you know, some people say, well, now look, one of the issues is we have too many guns. It's guns have to be addressed. How do you answer that criticism? Do we have too many guns? Well, I'm a data-driven guy. I like to go where the numbers lead me. And the reality is between 1992 and 2016, gun ownership in America almost doubled. But the most remarkable thing was gun violence dropped in half. So gun ownership doubled, gun violence dropped in half. So what was happening in that same time period? What was happening is we were going after the people using guns in the commission of a felony, violent repeat offenders, and we were prosecuting them, getting them off the streets. What happened after 2016 <coughs> is we got away from some of these tried and proved methods, and so you're seeing this revolving door catch and release program of repeat violent offenders. And I like to say the only thing you learn from history is nobody learns from history, right? <laughs> and a lot of these quote unquote reforms that people were pushing We've tried before. We tried them in the 1970s, cashless bail, early release of violent offenders, getting rid of mandatory minimums. And we tried that, and it led to a crime explosion, a lot of, of what I thought, pro-law enforcement, common sense reforms in the 80s and 90s that led to this huge, dramatic drop in murders and gun violence. And then we got away from it. And I think it's part of the reason why I got elected is I brought to this mindset of let's try what has worked and let's go after, if we want to lower gun violence, let's use the tools that work, go after the repeat violent offenders and get them off our streets. You know, school safety has become such an issue and concern for parents. Um, and, it, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, even in what you think is the most safest of neighborhoods, we don't know about active shooting and great concerns. 
even here in this school year that has started, there have been guns brought to schools. Yeah. There have been call-ins, as you know, and there has to be lockdowns. People are thinking about now we have to fence uh, in school and grounds and some of those measures. Uh, I can imagine 20 years ago if someone said, you know, we're going to have to have officers in elementary school for protection. How do we address the concerns now heightened about school safety? Well, you know, the governor put a record amount of money in the budget for school resource officers. Those are individuals that can be there, that can protect the school and build a rapport with the students. Uh, I had a round table up in Fauquier where I got to meet with some of the school resource officers. Uh, they build a real bond with the kids. They actually, the kids feel more comfortable coming to them than maybe the principal, but what they're seeing in the schools, if they tell the school resource officers as somebody who's brought a weapon to school. But I think it goes to a larger issue, which, you know, we have gone through a lot the last two years as a country. Our American family has gone through a lot with the pandemic and everything with it. And, you know, if you've ever had a loved one that has dealt with either depression or addiction, uh, they will tell you social isolation is the single worst box you can ever put them in. And that's what we just did to 300 million Americans. It was like squeezing the air in a balloon. We took pretty dramatic actions to try to defeat the virus, and we're getting out of that, thank God. But the reality is we are seeing some of the ramifications of shutting down our schools and our churches, and we're social creatures. What happens when we're already fraying at the end where more people were uh, on their cell phones? I mean, 50% of Americans don't even know the name of their neighbors. And so when you're socially isolated, the problems of addiction and mental health comes with that. And so you have seen that trickle down into our schools. I have school aged children. I know the one thing you want more than anything else when you drop them off or take them to the bus stop is you just want them to be safe. Uh, you want them to get a great education and you want them to be safe. And so we are absolutely committed to getting school resource officers and, and helping to make sure that our school districts and our schools have the resources to make sure they have the security apparatus to make sure our schools are safe. Um, I think that's a huge issue for us. But we have to recognize that coming out of this pandemic, uh, we have a mental health crisis in this country and an addiction crisis. We have to make sure we have those tools as well to address that um, and as we kind of get through this period. You know, another big increase, it seems to me, is gang activity. It seems it appears that they're getting more violent, more aggressive, more visible. And so gangs, I think, or behind a lot of the, of the, of the problems, in, yeah. especially in inner cities. Yeah, you have seen an influx of, uh, you know, MS-13 is kind of based in D.C. You've seen some of the cartels move up, tragically, in Interstate 81. Uh, you absolutely have a problem with gang activity, and some of it is um, so many of these kids have come from broken homes. Uh, I come from a broken home. Uh, uh, my, and so I can only imagine if my image of what it was to become a man was from other teenagers my age. And I was luckily blessed with some, some good folks from my church and other men I was able to see and look to as examples. But uh, young men, if they are seeing those examples from other young men, they get naturally drawn to gang activity. And so I, I had a conversation with the Roanoke police chief and he, he told me, he said, we have too many young men that are desperate for money, power, and respect. And I, I love that when I talk to high school groups, I say, listen, the only thing age gives you is perspective. Uh, that's the only thing. You still make mistakes, but it gives you a perspective. And so uh, when you're 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, you want money, power, and respect. And that is a huge problem. And so we both have to recognize this a gang activity. We need to go after gang leaders that are recruiting younger gang members uh, to get them off the streets. Uh, and so there's proper penalties, but also the, the need for both mentorship programs are at an all-time high for our young men that are coming out of this social isolation and they, they're getting the influences of what it is to be a good so citizen in our society from some of the wrong voices. We want to make sure they have the right voices. You know, um, drugs is such a, a large category, uh, but drug arrests have cut almost in half. And they say it's largely due, if we look at the marijuana specifically, the decriminalization in 20 and some of the legalization of small amounts of marijuana in 2021. But my goodness, what is the future in terms of retail and selling and those kinds of issues? Because it, it seems from what I've read 
states who go full into marijuana in terms of the sale and what have you, the crime rates go up. Yeah, that's the thing that's so remarkable. And we are facing something that we've never seen before as a country. Uh, it used to be that if you wanted to distribute illegal narcotics, uh, you needed land, you needed weather, and you needed a distribution network. Now, because of fentanyl, you just need the chemicals. Um, and what has happened is it is so cheap to manufacture. Enough fentanyl crossed our southern border in the last 12 months to kill every American in this country. Good heavens. It is 50 times more powerful than heroin, 100 times more powerful than morphine. Uh, I joined with 20 other state attorney generals uh, to ask President Biden to declare fentanyl a WMD, mm -hmm. because it is. We've, last, we've lost 100,000 Americans in the last 12 months to fentanyl and opioid overdoses. And you hear these numbers and it's hard to contextualize, but, but the example I use is we lost a little over 50,000 men and women in Vietnam over 15 years. Mm -hmm. We're losing 100,000 in 12 months. 50,000 died at the nuclear bomb in Hiroshima. So we're having the equivalent of two nuclear bombs go off in this country. Those are 100,000 deaths, but those are numbers I've met every single day. I feel I meet a new family that has lost someone to addiction. That is a missing chair at every Thanksgiving, at every birthday, and it is ripping families apart. And a lot of it is this volume of narcotics coming over our southern border right now it is a huge, huge problem. It's uh, a tool that I have asked for as a piece of legislation I carried when I was in the House of Delegates that said, listen, if you're a drug dealer and you sell fentanyl and they're lacing fentanyl now, marijuana and fake Percocets, pills, people have no idea they're ever taking it, you should be prosecuted for murder. If I give you that poison, I know if I give you this marijuana laced with fentanyl, it's going to kill you. As a prosecutor, I should have the ability of charging you with murder charges. Well, that was a bipartisan bill that got to the previous governor's desk. Governor Ralph Northam, he vetoed it. We had high hopes this year was going to get through. It died in the state Senate. We're going to revive it. It's something that a lot of common sense prosecutors and law enforcement have asked for because you have to both have a dual track. You have to go after the dealers, get them off the street, charge them as with the maximum uh, penalties you can to get them off the street. But they're struggling with addiction, give them the resources and the rehab and the treatment so they can get better. Because um, you know a lot of the addicts we're dealing with right now, they didn't start off on heroin. They start off using opioids. Mm -hmm. And some of the biggest pill pushers were not drug dealers on the corner, it was Purdue Pharma and yes. some of these other pharmaceutical companies right. that sold, uh, told these doctors these were not addictive. Some of the most addictive uh, drugs ever known to man that we pushed out. And so tragically, people get addicted and defeat it. They, they switch to heroin and others. And so for the addicts, for people struggling with addiction, uh, getting them the help, uh, getting them in the treatment, I think is critical. And then you have to go out to dealers. But it is something that every, every part of Virginia I go to, I was on Tangier Island, middle of the Chesapeake Bay. You can only get there by boat or by plane. 400 people live in that island. I asked them, what's your number one issue that you all are facing? They said fentanyl. They'd had four overdoses on an island of 400 people in the last 12 months. So it doesn't matter what region, it doesn't, doesn't matter how remote you are, this is impacting your community. We're doing everything in our power to try to stem the tide and, and push back. Well, you've been successful in getting some settlements in very large uh, numbers, we, too. We have. We've had some of the largest uh, settlements in Virginia's history. Yeah. Over half a billion dollars is coming back to Virginia, and that's not going to my office. Uh, we set up the Opioid Abatement Authority. It's, it's headed up by State Senator Todd Pillianer from Southwest Virginia. And the idea is every community has their own um, tools to help with addiction, those struggling with addiction. So the Opioid Abatement Authority is going to give out that half a billion dollars in grant money to help with those struggling with addiction. And that's going to be a huge part of how we beat this, this scourge. Uh, but I really think the federal government needs to declare fentanyl what it is. It's a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, you have to give law enforcement the tools they need to stop and disrupt and then make sure we have the adequate resources to, to stem the tide on addiction. You know, I have to confess that I found it rather surprising and really had no idea. You've been holding uh, roundtables on human trafficking. And I have to say that that was not in anywhere in terms of my radar as an issue. Could you help explain the degree of that? Yeah, human trafficking is one of these um, 
tragic crimes that, that hides in plain sight. If you may think it's not happening in your community, it absolutely is. Mm. Uh, it is a $1.5 billion international business. And uh, it comes in a lot of forms. One of it is, uh, one, of the, one of the crises we have on the border is a lot of these cartels are trafficking in young girls and children uh, and using them sex slaves. Uh, but then also what we've seen, you know, as I said earlier, we're, we, we, we shut down society to beat COVID. And so now we have an addiction and mental health crisis. What we've also seen is a rise of familial trafficking that addiction can be so horrific that you're willing to literally traffic your own daughter or your own sister wow. to feed your addiction. Mm -hmm. And so uh, raising awareness, working with law enforcement on the human trafficking, a lot of these are intertwined, a lot of the, the gang and organized crime or cartels, uh, they'll traffic in drugs, they'll also traffic in human beings. Wow. And it's a multi-generational crime. You, you talk to the survivors of human trafficking, when they're midst of it, Sometimes they don't even realize how exploited they are and how they're, they're victims, but it affects them. It affects their future relations with their future partners, their future children. It is one of the most loathsome of all crimes. And so that was a huge priority for mine since day one. That's a huge priority for the governor as well uh, to disrupt these human trafficking uh, networks to go after these individuals. And it also those shows you how crime is related you know, we, we changed our larceny laws in Virginia. We got rid of petty larceny, third offense, things of that nature. I had a meeting about organized retail crime theft. One of the briefings that was shared with me is one of the principal ways that they are paying for advertising and online um, sex ads for these human trafficking victims are stolen gift cards. They go into these different department stores, they, sell the, they steal the gift cards and then help pay for, so that's a larceny related crime. You don't think that by decriminalizing some of this or prosecutors in certain areas saying we're no longer gonna prosecute petty larceny. The reality is sometimes the only way to disrupt some of these uh, criminal enterprises is you go after them on petty larceny. You get them with what the crime that they're breaking. And so uh, there are no victimless crimes. And that's an example of, of a crime that sometimes you hear in the media outlets, petty larceny doesn't matter that much. And then you get a briefing and saying, well, wow, petty larceny is leading some of these criminal enterprises. It's one of the ways they're helping to fund their human trafficking. And so it's interrelated, and that's why you have to be vigilant um, in this whole process. Well, you know, we're down to a couple to three minutes or so remaining. What's ahead in terms of initiatives that are forthcoming with your concerns? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud that I'm going to be getting together with Frank Beamer, the Virginia legend, former Virginia Tech coach. He approached me. Uh, about National Child ID. And uh, what that is, is it's an initiative. It's not a database. I want to be clear. It's not some central database. Uh, it's a simple envelope that um, we'll provide to any family that requests it. And, uh, you know, if you, not, in a nightmare scenario, have a child that is abducted or taken from you, there's always three things law enforcement asks for. Number one, they ask for a photograph. That's easy. Everybody has a photograph to a loved one. They also ask for their fingerprints and their DNA. Those last two are really hard, and the 20, first 24 hours in an abduction are the most critical. Uh, if you have a loved one that's taken from you, and what we've also seen in human trafficking is, you'll have a, a, a 13, 14, 15 year old girl to strike up a, an internet friendship with somebody that they think they're talking to another 15 year old. The reality, they're talking to a, a 25, 26 year old uh, that's running a human trafficking ring, and they'll go to meet them, and then they're abducted. And so National Child ID is something that you keep safe, keep it in your family Bible or, or keep it in a desk drawer. And if the worst, worst comes ever, you're able to immediately provide law enforcement some of the most important tools they can to track down and help identify uh, their child. And so it has been used in other states. I'm really excited about it. Uh, we're going to be tackling it in the future. And, and so I'm, I'm happy to team up with Coach Beamer on this and uh, get the word out about this free tool available to families to make sure their child's safe. Well, you know, I'm so sorry that we're about to run out of time. Thank you so much for your kindness and willingness to join us in the conversation. I really appreciate that. As always, honored to be with you, Bob. And I certainly want to thank you for joining me, and I hope you do so again on the next conversation with Bob Denton.